So it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you here tonight to our Galveston Bay Foundation quarterly membership meeting. Uh, my name is Bob Stokes. I'm the director of the Galveston Bay Foundation. And uh, we really appreciate your attendance and your interest in our presentation on oysters in Galveston Bay tonight. So uh, before we get started, uh, we've got a couple uh, elected officials in the audience. Um, Representative Keene is going to be part of our panel and he'll be the speaker, so I'll, I'll wait to introduce him. But uh, Representative Wayne Fairclough is here as well and just wanted to say a quick hello. So thank you for joining us, Representative Fairclough. So, um, you know, oysters in Texas are, are really, it, it's been a long-term issue uh, of, of, of really impacts and problems, uh, certainly over the last decade uh, or, or longer. Uh, you know, I won't even go back to when we used to harvest oyster shell out of Galveston Bay to build roads, but we're way past that. Uh, but, um, so we had uh, Hurricane Ike back in 2008. And that really created a lot of problems for our oyster reefs and our oystermen in, in Texas and Galveston Bay. Uh, we had over 50 or 60 percent of our reefs covered with sediment, uh, certainly in the East Bay, and so it had a huge impact. And then we had uh, this long drought, uh, 2011, 2012. And for those of you who may be familiar with oysters, you know oysters can live in high salinity, but so do their predators. And predators really proliferate when the salinity levels get high for a long time. So Oysters were struggling, we had some uh, red tide and things like that, and it just you know, was not good in the short term for oysters. And then, of course, the drought broke, and it hadn't stopped raining since then. Uh, you know, we had a, a giant flood in 2015, and another giant flood in 2016, and of course, Hurricane Harvey, which, uh, you know, the, the granddaddy of all the floods uh, in our region, which has caused even more problems than the first two floods. And again, oysters tolerate a variety of salinity levels, but when there's a lot of fresh water, when there's entirely fresh water, they die pretty quickly. And so we're going to hear about that tonight as well. We'll hear about the impact from Harvey. But again, you know, the meeting is really about longer term <coughs> issues. And so that uh, led the Galveston Bay Foundation to really get into a greater focus on oyster restoration. After Hurricane Ike uh, in particular, uh, we started our oyster shell recycling program with Tom Tillet, who I'll introduce in a minute. Tom owns Tommy's Restaurant and Oyster Bar in Clear Lake. Uh, we started that back in 2011 because we had all these restaurants serving oysters on the half shell and throwing away the half shell. They were putting them in the trash and then in the landfill. And so Tom was our pilot effort. It was Tom who came to us really. He said, we'd like to really see this shell recycled. And so we started this oyster shell recycling program. Uh, and since 2011, we've recycled over 700 tons of oyster shell that we will put back into the bay for oyster restoration. And we've done a little bit of, uh, you know, what we call oyster gardening, where we work with landowners to, to put the shell in the bay and grow baby oysters. We've used those oysters for shoreline protection. And we are actually working with uh, Lance's group at Texas Parks and Wildlife and the Nature Conservancy to do a larger scale oyster reef restoration project in Galveston Bay in the next couple of years. So we've really made it more of a focus. But restoration is not simply the issue. There's, there's broader issues. And, and management of the fishery, uh, management of the commercial harvest of oysters in Galveston Bay is a significant part of the puzzle. And so we've known, we've seen, you know, a lot of pressure on oysters in Galveston Bay 
since 2008 and probably even earlier. Uh, you know, the supply is not there, but the demand is there. The demand is actually increasing over time. Uh, people love oysters. I mean, who doesn't, you know, who loves eating oysters in the audience, right? So, you know, there's, there's all, you know, all of us and, and many more. And so, there's a lot of, uh, you know, competition, a lot of pressure to harvest as many oysters as is physically possible, really. And so, we are fortunate, um, well, uh, you know, all depends on your point of view, but it brought a lot of attention from the legislature this past session. Uh, it also brought attention from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission uh, to address some management issues. And so, uh, Senator, uh, Senator, Representative Gein, uh, is uh, doesn't have a lot of oysters in his county, but he's a really successful, long-term representative in, in the Texas House, and uh, you know has worked with CCA and others on conservation issues. Uh, and got involved in the drafting of the HB 51. And I'm gonna invite him up here to speak about that in a minute. Uh, but just to set the stage of our panel, we also have Lance Robinson. Lance is, uh, I don't wanna to get too much into the bios because they're really long and they're all really impressive, but uh, Lance is Deputy Director of Management, uh, Resource Director of the Coastal Fisheries Division. And he's sort of the boss on oysters, in, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, I think that's probably correct. Um, and so he's gonna talk about some changes that the commission took. So the commission, Texas Parks and Wildlife is governed by a, by a commission, an appointed commission from the governor's office, and they have to uh, vote yes or no on some of these changes to the regulations. And so literally two days before uh, Hurricane Harvey hit, they voted a package of, of changes that we hope will improve oyster fisheries in, in Texas and Galveston Bay. So uh, we'll hear from Lance. But then we also, you know, our, our kind of motto, what we hold ourselves to, is kind of working with all the bay users. Uh, we've always tried to work with the recreational folks and the commercial folks and the industrial folks. And so we also recognize that there's really hard working people out there who are trying to make a living in Galveston Bay by harvesting oysters. And so we are fortunate enough to have uh, Tracy Woody with Jerry Seafood and Roz Lealy with Prestige Oysters. Uh, they're out there, you know, making a living. And, we understand it's really hard work and there's a lot of pressure, and so we wanted to hear from them and hopefully engage them in the discussion about how to make this a long-term sustainability effort. And so, uh, Roz already gave him a little bit of a hard time, but uh, he's sort of an internet heart for all. after Hurricane Harvey. I don't know if you've seen the viral uh, picture that went around. He was apparently rescuing people in a boat, you know, sort of a hero type thing. And, well, apparently some women seem to like it, so <laughs> he, he, he can maybe talk more about that. Tracy, I don't know if that applies to you, but, uh, <laughs> but in any case, in all seriousness, uh, so, so that's the panel we put together. Uh, it was really about uh, oyster management, the fishery. We will talk about Hurricane Hard and the impacts, but it's just another impact and a succession of impacts to Galveston Bay oysters in particular. So, uh, Representative Pia, you know, I'd love to introduce you and and have you come up. Um, Representative Keehan, uh, we already heard some of this, he's a sixth generation South Texas rancher, family man, businessman, he is a National Guardsman, a uh, former ag teacher, uh, known for passing more legislation than any other state representative in the last decade. Uh, he's been named the best legislator and legislator of the year by nearly a dozen organizations. So this is a really effective legislator. He's been in the Texas House since 2002, uh, and he's, uh, I guess he finished up his sixth term, and uh, so we want to hear about your interest in oysters, the story behind HB 51, and again, thank you for your interest, because I think you've done great work for the state of Texas. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, I uh, want to first of all thank Scott Jones from the Galveston Bay Foundation for for the invitation. He first called me several months ago and uh, wanted me to come talk to you all about oysters. And I said, well, I don't know much about oysters, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, and so I suggested a few people uh, to come and, and, and talk about oysters. But I, he said, no, but we still want you there. I said, okay, I can be there. So I appreciate the opportunity to come. And, and yeah, I don't, uh, I don't represent uh, the Galveston Bay. Uh, I, I've got, I represent 10 counties south of San Antonio, uh, a couple of which are on the coast, uh, but we don't have much in the way of, of oysters out there. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, 
I don't represent one of those bays. I don't represent Galveston Bay. I don't represent uh, a bay that is a major oyster, uh, estuary for uh, oysters. But I do appreciate the fact that um, uh, my, my great colleague, uh, Representative Wayne Faircloth, is here. And uh, I know I've talked to him a great deal about these issues over the last couple of years, the last several years, that he's been in the legislature and he's uh, gotten real involved uh, with them and he represents uh, the area very well and I appreciate that he's here today and and uh, appreciate all the work that he's done in this regard and, and working with, uh, with uh, my colleagues and myself uh, this last legislative session in, in getting a couple of things done. Um, I, uh, of course, I also want to mention uh, my other colleague, Dennis Bonnet, who uh, couldn't make it today, but uh, he, of course, was uh, a great, is a great leader in the Texas House, a great friend, and uh, was a great uh, part of, of this legislation, these couple of bills we passed this last session, um, and very involved in, in the process, and particularly, uh, particularly in, uh, with these issues. Um, I, 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 even though I don't represent uh, uh, these areas, I, I do understand and appreciate uh, the ecological and economic uh, significance of oysters uh, to our great state. And uh, I, of course, uh, uh, had, uh, you know, my share of oysters in, in my day. Um, uh, I'm a great fan and, and I love oysters and um, uh, s some years ago uh, as chair of the Culture, Recreation, and Tourism Committee, a committee that oversees uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and uh, some other um, agencies, uh, we had many people come, t come before us and talk to us about these issues and of course it, it intrigued me. And uh, so I engaged a little bit into, into those issues. I, I definitely want to thank the uh, Coastal Conservation Association for all the work that they do. Uh, and I, I'd be remiss to, to mention that they, of course, were uh, one of the primary reasons that uh, I uh, have done much of the work uh, on oysters. They've uh, come to me and asked me to do one thing or another. And, and of course, I, I uh, start to explore those issues with them and, and, and move forward with them. Um, you know, when, when I, driving up here yesterday, I, I, uh, I had to come up a day early and today I, I called my staff and I asked them uh, to send me the address where I'd be going and the last couple of days I've been telling everybody that I had to be in Galveston uh, today and um, so they sent me the address and I looked at it, it was a Houston address and and um, anyway needless to say I'm here I thought I was going to be in Galveston tonight <laughs> um, I thought I was going to be having oysters too <laughs> but but anyway I I, uh, I, uh, I appreciate the fact that y'all uh, are uh, so involved with the Galveston Bay Foundation. I think the Galveston, I think the world of the Galveston Bay Foundation, I appreciate all the work that they're doing. And I just want to say that, you know, um, the work that y'all do, um, the, uh, this industry that is so important uh, matters to the state of Texas. And uh, I know it matters to your legislators. And uh, I don't know what the answers are to, to the many challenges that we've had. These droughts that we've had, these floods that we've had, this, this tremendous flood that we just had, uh, it's no doubt uh, devastating for uh, this industry. And uh, as we go forward, as we look forward to the next legislative session, and um, I, I just want to be a partner. Um, again, I, I don't I don't know much about the industry. Uh, all I know is what I'm, uh, what I'm told and what, I've, and, and what I've learned in the last few years. And what I do know is I know the legislative process a little bit. I've been around it a, a little bit. And, um, and I think that's why I was invited here uh, to speak to you all tonight. 
I, uh, I hope that the legislation that we, that we passed will contribute at least a little bit to, uh, to help the industry. Um, and I, I don't think that uh, this is the last we're going to hear of this uh, issue. I think that, uh, we've got challenges ahead and, and, and I stand ready to, uh, to partner with my good friend Wayne and, and uh, Dennis and um, anyone else who wants to take on the challenges uh, and uh, to do good for, for this bay and for all those bays that are the main um, estuaries to, uh, to oysters. It's an important industry in the state of Texas, and um, I hope that uh, y'all can count on, uh, please do count on me uh, to help uh, in any way that I can, uh, to help uh, push along anything that we need to do and to make, uh, to make the Galveston Bay uh, and the coast uh, even better than it is today. Uh, thank you again for having me. I'm going to be I'm going to be sitting here for a while if y'all want to visit. Um, I uh, again I, I really appreciate uh, the fact that y'all asked me to be here and, and appreciate uh, the opportunity to come address y'all. And uh, please know again that uh, my door is open and I want to. I want to help in any way that I can, uh, as long as I can. So, uh, thank you all for having me here. So, we have a, uh, a little certificate of appreciation uh, from the Galveston Bay Foundation to Representative Ryan Gein from the Texas House District, District 31 uh, for his leadership on legislation regarding the Texas oyster industry and authorship of the 85th Legislative Session, House Bill 51, signed into law on June 12, 2017, which, is, which enhances the sustainability of the oyster fishery in Galveston Bay in the state of Texas. So just wanted to say thank you and, and shake your hand and, and take a quick picture. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I've got this page of notes and I uh, didn't get through. So uh, a couple things that I missed. And, and, Give me a second, Scott, because I was actually going to introduce you. <laughs> so, uh, Scott is our director of advocacy, uh, and he's been heavily engaged in this. He helped set up, he did set up tonight. I uh, invited all of our speakers. Uh, he went to the Texas legislature back in the spring uh, and testified uh, on behalf of HB 51 for the Galveston Bay Foundation. Uh, he went to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission meeting, again, two days before Hurricane Harvey hit Houston and testified in support of the, of the changes that Lance is going to talk about. So I just wanted to recognize Scott for his great work. Uh, and then Shane Bonneau is uh, in the audience too. Uh, Shane, where are you? Uh, there we go, right? So Shane is, uh, works with CCA, and, and CCA is just an awesome partner for, for GBF. Uh, you know, we're like the little brother looking up to CCA sometimes, but uh, we work really well together on a lot of issues, the same as in the waste pits. Uh, on this issue with oyster fisheries, so it's great to have the support and partnership with CCA in these efforts as well. And then one thing I, I just kind of wanted to set the stage, I know many of you are, are kind of familiar with the, uh, with the storm issue, and, and I, I don't want to talk about that tonight. Uh, it's not really the focus of, of, and I won't get into it even, the details right now, hopefully some of you know about it, but I, I consider that a symptom of the problems of the oyster fishery in Galveston that you know, if we had a healthy, strong oyster fishery, maybe we wouldn't have those problems. But it's really not what we're here to talk about tonight. And I think, really tonight, I hope that, that Roz and Tracy are allies in the effort to, to really move forward with uh, a healthy oyster fishery in Galveston Bay. Uh, they're not here to talk about anything that might have gone on in the past. Um, so, with that said, uh, Lance, you are the one who is up next. Uh, and I've already kind of introduced Lance as really our, our uh, he used to be here in, in Dickinson, but he, was so successful in moving to Austin. And so Lance gets to talk about some of the changes that both the legislature and uh, the, the commission made on oyster fishery. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to come. Can everybody hear me okay? I tend to roam. A little, okay, I'll try to stay close to the mic. Give me one second. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see what's 
Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much again for the opportunity to come and speak with everyone tonight. And, and it's nice to kind of be kind of back home. Um, you know, I miss the Galveston area, the, the, the city, and the Dickinson area. Uh, I was asked to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, some of the issues that we're kind of observing, have been observing for the last few years, dealing with oysters. And, and kind of by way of introduction, I wanted to kind of set the stage. Bob did a great job kind of laying some of the groundwork uh, in some of the things. In fact, he's, he, uh, he actually spoke about my first slide here, uh, and so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But suffice it to say that, you know, Galveston Bay has been the, the engine that has been driving the oyster industry in the state of Texas for decades. Prior to Hurricane Ike, Galveston Bay was responsible for, for producing about 80% of all the oysters harvested in the state of Texas. Hurricane Ike was a game changer. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that, as Bob alluded to, is that there was a, a storm that provided, brought a lot of sediment in there. We had a lot of siltation over moisture <coughs> reefs, especially in East Galveston Bay. By our estimates, using side scan sonar and looking at the, the impact on the consolidated reefs, these are the big main reefs, not, not the you know, scattered shell and in the, in the, around the muds and stuff, which is a viable part of the resource. But the big major reef complexes, we lost over half of that over 8,000 acres of oyster reef in Galveston Bay. In East Galveston Bay, it was 80% loss of, of, due to sedimentation. As we did our analysis and kind of looking at that, that impact, how significant was it, um, we, we partnered with Texas A&M Galveston and they had some equipment that allowed us to go in and actually map the thickness of the sediment over, the, over these reefs. And, and using that, we were able to kind of guide us toward uh, kind of that low-hanging fruit as we look toward trying to do some restoration work. But some of the areas in Galveston Bay, especially in East Bay, you know, are, are now sitting there with over two feet of sediment over the top of these reefs. Certainly in the time since Hurricane Ike, some of those have been re-exposed through normal storm and, and, and current action. And in fact, uh, we had already started planning efforts uh, earlier this next year, and we'll still continue to do it. But we're going to go back and repeat that sub-bottom profiling work that we did uh, with A&M to kind of see what the reefs look like now with sediment over the top of it. So 2008, we had Hurricane Ike. It changed the game. No longer is Galveston producing 80% of the oysters in the state. Uh, following that, it, it dropped fairly, fairly quickly uh, and to about a third of all the oysters uh, being produced came out of Galveston. The, the oyster industry is a very, very dynamic industry in the sense that the fleet is very mobile, and, and certainly they, they have the ability to move to wherever the resource is, and we saw that in some of our harvests. Other base systems that traditionally hadn't seen the type of harvest pressure, harvest activity, and, and certainly the availability of resource that Galveston had, <coughs> suddenly had oysters uh, uh, being harvested out of these systems. Follow up uh, 2008 with um, 2010, and we had the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and Fortunately for Texas, we didn't have any direct impacts from that spill. We didn't have oil on our beaches. We didn't have, uh, like the other four states along the Gulf, we didn't have oyster reefs that were closed because of oil that had, had uh, inundated over the tops of these reefs. And, uh, but, but we did have what we consider a secondary impact. At a, at a point in time during that spill, every state along the Gulf, except Texas, had closed their entire oyster harvest <coughs> fisheries uh, all along the Gulf Coast. So the only place you could get an oyster from the Gulf of Mexico during this spill event, at a, at a period during the spill event, was from Texas. And so what that does is it, it, with a high demand for a product like this, it puts a little extra harvest pressure on the available resources that are, that are there. And we certainly saw that in the landings numbers that came in following that. And as Bob mentioned, the, 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 the drought that came, and, and he alluded to you know, the, the impacts it has on oysters, uh, or their, their predators, uh, and then we also had um, uh, the, all the floods that we've seen uh, uh, since then. So one of the things that, that we, we see as, as availability of, of, of resource, of product, you know, becomes less and less, the value of that product will oftentimes go up. This slide just represents the total landings over time uh, as depicted by the yellow bar, and the red is the price per pound of oyster meat, and, uh, and you can see they're kind of diverging from each other, meaning that as the, as the availability of oysters drop, the price of that product is going up uh, also. Now, one thing I will point out, that precipitous looking decline that you see starting about 2014 on that red graph, that, that is not a direct indication of the, uh, it's kind of a secondary indication, I guess you could say, of, of the condition of the resource, 
But in 2014, Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, through some, some assistance from the legislature, allowed the department or granted the, the department and the executive director to, to be able to use uh, emergency closure uh, capabilities to step in and close an area down when it was determined that the reefs and the oysters had been depleted. Uh, the commission has had that authority, our commission, but they meet four or five times a year. And so to really be reactive when problems come up, um, the, 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 the need to have the ability of our executive director to be able to act quickly uh, to stop, you know, close some of the harvest down on these areas was really important. So the red line there that you see dropping is really an artifact in some respect of when we started implementing management closures uh, up and down the coast. Now as the fleets begin to move and as we close areas down, Obviously, when an area can't be fished, the fishermen need a place to go make a, make a living. So they're going to look for areas where they can actually uh, harvest oysters. And some of you may have seen this picture. This is Tracy, I think, uh, you know, his son, I think, shot this in a video. Uh, but this is a 30-acre restoration site in Galveston Bay. Uh, we had received some disaster money from, uh, from Hurricane I um, Ike. Uh, yeah, Hurricane Ike. And it used it to restore a reef, a uh, dollar reef there in Galveston Bay. Uh, it had been closed for two years uh, in order to allow those oysters to reach legal size, three inches. And so we opened it up and very quickly, because of the availability of resource or lack thereof in, in some other areas, uh, we see this kind of harvest pressure that will quickly come in and, and, and work, uh, work these areas. This last year, we also saw uh, some new, I mean, this, this practice has been going on uh, for, for decades, but it really at the magnitude that, that we saw this last year was a little bit unprecedented. Uh, this is a picture from Christmas Bay. Uh, Christmas Bay, uh, in, in many years, have been closed because the water quality, based on the state health department classification, has been closed for commercial oyster harvest or any harvest of oysters. Uh, it has been open for the last few years, though, uh, and then last year, because of the lack of availability of oyster resources in the more traditional deeper water reefs, we started seeing a shift in behavior of the, of the angler, the fishermen, uh, moving more towards shallow reefs uh, and, and harvesting oysters by hand. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that really has been uh, relatively new information that's coming out of, primarily out of Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and Dr. Greg Stunts and, and some of his staff down there and some of his students, uh, they've been doing a lot of work with oysters up and down the coast, and they're finding some information uh, about oysters that really we didn't know about uh, even as recently as five or six years ago. And so some of that information, you know, is depicted in some of these bullets here. One of the things that, that they are finding in these shallow water oyster habitats, these shallow reefs and these shallow bays and these fringing reefs along shorelines, very shallow, is that they're incredibly high in diversity uh, of species compared to other habitat types that we all think about being very productive, seagrass beds and marsh habitat. They're finding in their studies that oyster reefs are in fact much more uh, produ productive in, a, in certainly decapod crustaceans, marsh uh, habitat. So, so they're very, very important. And, and if you see some of the information here, it wasn't done by Dr. Stunts, but some other researchers around the country looking and trying to value uh, what, it, what is that economic value of oyster reef. Because, you know, besides it has an incredibly important value from a commercial fishing standpoint, but it also has value from the ecosystem services that are provided by those oysters. They're filter feeders. They clear up water, improve water quality. Uh, they work uh, to, to, to uh, abate wave energy and protect against erosion. Uh, they sequester carbon and, and nitrogen from the system. So that they have all of these very important services that they provide and make this ecosystem more healthy. Uh, and so these values you can see here, some of the studies done, it could be as high as several, several hundred thousand dollars per acre for an oyster reef. And that doesn't include the added value of commercial harvest or the added value of recreational habitat for recreational fishing uh, and things like that. So a very important um, and, uh, uh, habitat type and location and it played very heavily in some of the decisions I think the commission, uh, uh, some of the changes they made and, and I'll speak to those in just a minute. Um, so looking at kind of what the bay looks like from an oyster population standpoint, we sample uh, with, our, with our gear, our staff will go out and sample oysters as, as well as other uh, gear for other species. 
And this is just some data from Galveston Bay, and, and I apologize, it's kind of a hard slide to read from the audience, but, but I think the, the thing that I want to point your attention to, the yellow bar, the yellow line that you see there is small oysters. That's kind of the juvenile that's moving in. We, we classify small as anything from less than three inches to about one inch. Uh, anything less than one inch is depicted by the dotted line. And then the legal or market oysters, three inches, the red line, which is at the lowest part of the, of the graph there. And so if you look at this, and as we look at it, uh, this is just for Galveston Bay, and we have these kinds of, of slides for, for our uh, data for every bay system on the coast. The thing that we want to look for, things that we want to see happening, is that yellow line staying up. And it sometimes it's cyclic. Uh, we get spawning events that'll, uh, that'll go up and down over multiple years, depending on environmental conditions. So we like to see you know, a pretty good cycle, a lot, a lot of highs relative to the lows. And in more recent years, we're not seeing that in Galveston Bay. We're not seeing a lot of recruitment. Uh, it's certainly the numbers that we would like to see. We're getting some spat set, but not as much as we used to, uh, you know, back in, you know, as recently as the early 2000s. And so these, these types of information are things that we are looking at, um, you know, as we make our decisions. And so, as I mentioned, some of the, the things that the, our commission recently addressed uh, the, this is some of the current regulations. These are the current regulations in the state of Texas. Those items that are kind of had a strike through on it are what were the current regulations prior to the commission action, which occurred uh, in late August. Uh, the, the, the items in yellow are the changes that the commission made. So, so first, uh, they reduced the daily sack limit. These all go into effect November the 1st um, uh, of this year. Uh, the daily harvest sack limit will be 30 sacks a day. Um, Legal fishing time it didn't change. They allowed the fish from uh, basically sunrise to 3:30 in the afternoon, uh, and then the legal fishing days will now be Monday through Friday. Saturday and Sunday will be closed to commercial harvest. Uh, and again, part of the rationale and the reasoning behind this lowering the sack limit and even reducing number of days is, is is to try to help control some of the high harvest pressure that's ex being exerted on on the resource. And, and I'll speak to some of that in just a minute as well. A uh, three inch minimum size, that didn't change. And then the other issue here is the percent of the tolerance for undersized oysters that is, that is allowed within a cargo of, of oysters. When, when, a, when a fisherman harvests oysters, you can see in the box that Tracy brought in outside, uh, clumps of oysters, they clump together. And so the fishermen have to knock off those undersized oysters off of the legal. They only keep the legal and the undersized and the, the dead pieces of shell go back in the water. They serve as substrate that grow uh, to be legal, hopefully uh, very quickly. But the substrate goes back in and allows a, a, the, that, that substrate for, for juvenile oysters to settle on. And so as they, as they call the oysters in their catch, Oftentimes they will, uh, you know, oysters the way they grow. Sometimes you can, they'll grow so tight it's hard to get them apart. Uh, and sometimes you may just not see them. And so there's always been a tolerance that's been allowed for undersized oysters within a cargo. And, and, and a cargo is typically what's on the boat at the time that a law enforcement uh, game warden uh, boards that vessel. And so it has been 15%. 15% tolerance has been kind of the standard for at least since I've been with the department. Um, in, in statute, it, it allows it to go to 5%. Uh, and so some of the things that we were observing our law enforcement staff, again, it, and it's driven a lot, in my opinion, uh, I think it's driven a lot because of the lack of available legal oysters, that what we began to see is that a lot of, uh, a lot, a, a number of fishermen uh, and, and some dealers uh, were buying uh, and undersized oysters uh, to the significant numbers of undersized oysters. These are oysters that are less than, than uh, three inches. And, uh, and so that was kind of helped fueling this engine that we had some dealers that were willing to buy illegal oysters, which was incentivizing fishermen to go out and catch these oysters because they were getting a good price for these sacks of oysters. And so one of the things that was happening as we then went in, stepped in, and looked at doing a management closure, our goal here is we, we look at the catch rate of legal oysters. And when it drops below a certain threshold, we'll step in, close it, let those juvenile, those undersized oysters, those oysters that are between two and three inches, allow them some time to grow up into that legal oysters. And generally that is the next season. And so but what we were half seeing is when we would go in and assess these areas, that two inch oyster, those two to three inch oysters were gone. They weren't in the area. They had already been harvested. And so by the time we got a closure in place, we're protecting one inch oysters, or inch and a half of or inch oysters. And so it takes about, it's been taking two years for those oysters to grow large enough to allow us to reopen it, to get above that threshold 
that we have to allow that harvest to occur. And so that is certainly disruptive uh, to the industry because you've got these areas that are closed down uh, you know, for two years. It also becomes a, a challenge because as the boats move to these other areas, it puts additional pressure. You're concentrating effort in smaller areas. So, so it's been a real problem in trying to manage that way. And so some of, the, some of these rationales, some of these things here are an attempt to try to help curb some of that harvest pressure and allow some of those oysters to grow and to be a little more valuable. Um, one of the other things that, that was done, the commission did, is they closed six areas, six minor bays, uh, tertiary bays as we call them, uh, to, uh, to all oyster harvest. Uh, Christmas Bay in, uh, in, in the Galveston complex was the one that was, what is now closed uh, to commercial harvest, or to all oyster harvest. Uh, as you go down the coast in Matagorda Bay, Karankawa Bay, and Powderhorn Lake, uh, are, are now closed. Uh, San Antonio Bay, the Hines Bay complex, or the small uh, embayment in the upper part of that watershed is, is closed. St. Charles Bay, right off of um, Aransas, Copano Bay area, that area is closed. And South Bay, which is down in the lower Laguna Madre, which is kind of unusual in the sense that oysters, you know, generally like, and you, if you can look at it along our coast, they grow where you need a lot of fresh water. I mean, what we have now is too much, but, but they, they need that fresh water, and that's why Galveston has been so productive with oysters, is we have a good water supply with the Trinity and the San Jacinto Rivers in there. So it's kind of an anomaly to see that South Bay, you know, has an oyster population. But the oysters there have a, it's not really a commercial fishery, it hasn't been a commercial fishery for quite some time down there, but uh, they have adapted to higher salinity waters and are thriving and doing quite well uh, down in that system. So all of those systems are now closed and protected uh, to kind of help provide a, a seed source for larvae to help populate and also the, the value of that habitat that it provides to these other, uh, other organisms. This is kind of a map kind of shows you the, the spread along the coast of where these occur. I have Keller Bay lined up. Keller was one that, that was also proposed, but it was withdrawn uh, as, as we get, began to look at it. It was a, uh, a, a bit different than these other base systems, a little deeper, uh, a little different kind of uh, uh, environment there. And so it, it really didn't, as we look closer, it didn't really fit the, 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 the mold, if you will, of, of the other six bays. The other thing that, uh, and this just kind of gives you an idea of that total acreage now that is that would be protected from from uh, harvest. So you're looking at uh, a total of about 1,500 acres coastwide. Uh, that represents about three percent of all the oyster habitat in the state of Texas. That that is the uh, the protection part that that kicks in. And you can see the acres there. Powderhorn Lake is a shallow bay system. It's in fact. Uh, relatively so shallow and it's, in a lot of cases we can't get our, our, our gear in there and sample it so we're looking at some new uh, sampling methodologies to kind of be able to assess that. That's why I don't have a, an a acreage number there. We're looking at a number of other ways to quantify the, the acreage in that system. The other thing that the commission looked at was uh, this, this idea of intertidal oyster reefs. These are the ones along the shoreline that was kind of shown in that picture that, and I have to give credit, Shannon Tompkins from the Houston Chronicle was here. He, he provided that picture and let, allowed me to use it, and I appreciate him letting me uh, use that. I've used it a lot uh, of late. Uh, so another one of the issues here was the shallow water habitat, and so, so the commission opted to go ahead and close uh, the shallow water areas 300 feet from the water's edge uh, will be closed to oyster harvest, again, to protect that real shallow, very valuable oyster habitat that occurs there. And again, you'll see that accounts for about almost 1,300 acres. Combined with the, the, the six base systems, you're talking about a total of uh, 2,800 acres, or uh, about 6% of all the oyster habitat in Texas, a uh, fishable habitat in Texas. So, uh, Representative Guillen was certainly uh, instrumental in this, in this bill. I'll touch on it very briefly, uh, just to give you a flavor of, of what the bill does and, and, and kind of what the, I think the value and the power of, uh, that this bill is going to bring forward. Um, it does create the, the, allows our commission to uh, uh, establish a voluntary oyster license buyback program. We have licensed buyback programs in all of our commercial fisheries. There's been a more, except oysters and Gulf shrimp, but there are moratoriums on the licenses in all of those fisheries where we've capped the number of licenses that are, that are being sold in those fisheries. We're not issuing new licenses. If a new entrant wants to participate or get into the fishery, they'll have to they buy the license from another, another license holder, uh, and that's how they, the licenses are being transferred. 
Uh, so it does allow for the creation of a voluntary license buyback program. Uh, it would allow the, the fishermen, we open up a round, the fishermen will, will uh, kind of submit a, it's a reverse bid process. They send us their application uh, indicating what they're willing to, to uh, take for that, for that license. And then if it fits some criteria that we also build in and kind of look, come up with a range that falls into that as, as we've done in our other fisheries, uh, we, we try to retire that license and then we don't reissue it. And the whole idea is to try to get the, that effort down. It's not an overnight solution, it's very gradual. Uh, our shrimp fishery has been in place for over 20 years. Uh, and so, uh, and we still have some individuals who, uh, whenever we do a round, we have a handful of folks that, that are looking to, uh, to sell out and get out and hang, up, hang it up and, and sell their license back. And so uh, this will take a little time, I think, to get there. Um, and I'll show you one of the reasons why, uh, why this is going to be really important as we move forward. Um, it also allows the department working with the industry to explore the, the, the possibility, the option of looking at vessel monitoring systems. Uh, this is a technology that is used in a lot of other fisheries around the country, around the world. In fact, uh, typically we've seen it more on the high seas fisheries, but it's moving more and more into inshore fisheries. Uh, it's basically satellite. Uh, the trucking industry uses it a lot. To, they know where their vessel, their, their vehicles are. Uh, same type of technology. It's a, it's a satellite tracking system that allows uh, law enforcement and, and from a management purpose knowing, knowing how, many, how much pressure is being exerted on different reefs and things like that. So no funding for it, but it sort of it gives us an opportunity to, to discuss and work with industry to try to develop something, and then we'll be looking to see if we can identify some outside grants to, um, if, if we identify a, a, a tool that will work. Uh, the other thing I think is probably the most significant, in addition to the buyback component of this, that I think it will ultimately be the, the most significant issue with this particular bill, the, the value, is the return of culch back to the base. You know, as I, as I served you that slide earlier, you know, it showed the, the declines in our, in our lack of spat. We're not seeing a lot of spats up there. One of the things that we are observing, and we see it all up and down the coast, is that we've been removing substrate through oyster harvest. We're really not putting a lot back out on the bays. Uh, you know, the, the, the private leaseholders, they, they, could, they invest hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in putting culch onto their private beds. So there is certainly the industry recognizes there's a value in putting substrate back out in the water to allow the oysters to grow on. And so this section of the bill, which would require uh, uh, dealers who, who purchase oysters from fishermen, will be required to put a percentage of their of the shell that they generate back out into the bay, out of the public reef. So, so I think this is going to be a huge benefit in getting that substrate back out there that the oysters need to start uh, colonizing and growing. Um, we also, uh, there's some enforcement actions within this bill that necessitated that the, the deck hands also be licensed. So there's a, there's a, a $26 license that they will now have to carry. But it also, speaking to that, fit, that undersized issue that we're seeing, that harvest of undersized oysters, some of the violations that our law enforcement staff were seeing were, were just incredibly, in my, very egregious, if you, if you really want to know. I mean, we had an action that occurred in our middle bays in February. There were 68 cases made over a few day period of, for undersized oysters. Of those 68 cases, over 35% of them were over 30% undersized. And we had some vessels that were boarded that the, when they checked the cargo, they were 90% undersized in the cargo. Uh, we look at oysters in a sack from some of our work. We look at Galveston Bay up and down the coast and, and, and I don't know, Tracy and, and Raz may be able to correct me and give, me a, give more accurate information. We typically, when we sample, we look at a sack of oysters, a le of legal oysters, it's about 260 to 300 oysters in a sack is what we have determined based on looking at uh, legal sacks that law enforcement has, has checked. And so we had some of these cases they had that had over 1,200 oysters in one sack. And so, so some of these issues uh, you know, that with uh, House Bill 51, it, it, it kind of escalates or creates uh, some escalation of penalties. So as, as the, the penalties become more egregious, the penalty gets a little higher. Hopefully it will be a, a big, strong enough deterrent that that product will go stay in the water and go back in and, 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 a lot, and benefit everybody in the industry and, as well as the resource going forward, keeping that product uh, in the water longer. And I talked about the license buyback. This is a, just a graph of license sales. And I mentioned to you before that we have a moratorium on oyster licenses. Well, I can very quickly point out to you where, where that moratorium was passed by the legislature. If you look at where that bar goes way up, 
uh, that was the year that it was passed. The governor signed that bill in 2005, I think, I believe it was, five or something, five or somewhere right in there. Uh, five. And so uh, they signed the bill in June, and the way the bill was worded, it said as long as you have a license in this fishery, by August the 31st, you're in the fishery. And so there was a run on licenses. And so there was a lot of, we, we, and you see the blue line right there. That blue line actually represents the actual number of vessels that reported harvesting oysters. Uh, and we've been tracking this for years, and that's kind of been the, the number we see. It's hovered around 350 to 400 boats uh, in a given year that har actually report at least one sack of oysters harvested. And so when that, when that moratorium went into a place, we saw the speculation that kicked in. And so we went quickly from that 350 to 400 licenses to over 760. And now it's come down in time uh, through just natural attrition, but, but certainly the, the license buyback component of House Bill 51 will hopefully help accelerate some of these, this decline because if we ever ha hope to have a, a, any assemblance of, of, assemblance of recovery of this resource in, in a culture planning and, and all the management actions that we've been trying to take, and, 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 you know, and certainly these management actions are, are, are you know, are uh, uh, problematic, certainly, and, 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 and create major issues with industry because they're, you know, they're, they're looking to, to maximize their profits and, and their, their, their cus meet their customers' demands. So as we cut down sack limits, it certainly can, you know, eats into their, into their bottom line. And so the hope here is that as this, these, if we get some of this turned around, some of these latent licenses don't become active and just delay our attempts to get this resource recovered uh, faster. So any one of these licenses could become active and start fishing tomorrow, and that's just another uh, unit that we're having to kind of kind of deal with. So let's jump to 2017, August, September. Um, Hurricane Harvey is, was a, you know, as much as Hurricane Ike has been a game changer as it, as it relates to oyster, and it was, it has changed the, the whole landscape of oysters in the state of Texas. Hurricane Ike was that linchpin that has totally changed the dynamic. Her, Harvey is, is a different storm, but it equally has the potential to be a, a similar game, take, change, game changer. This is just a map showing the, the cumulative rainfall totals over a 30-day period. And you can see right in that white area, you know, Galveston Bay's there. And, and if you kind of look at that white area where that, that's a, that represents 20 plus inches of rainfall. Um, if you look at where that all fell, it's, most of it falls in the watershed of Galveston Bay. So even though it may not have fallen directly on top of Galveston Bay, it's going to flow into Galveston Bay and is flowing into Galveston Bay. So, so this, this, this freshwater event is res resulting from this storm is it, it, just unprecedented in anything we've seen in the United States and certainly in any area where, where there's oyster uh, habitat uh, you know, that's going to be exposed to these things. Uh, so, so we are in the process of you know, assessing the impact right now. Uh, we've had staff out, and I know Tracy and Rask can, can probably speak to it as well. They've been out looking at some of their leases, uh, but we're looking at some of the reefs. We still have a, a, a lot of work to do, but we are definitely seeing mortality. Some of our early numbers in Galveston, you know, it's very, very early. We're, I mean, the oysters we're seeing were dead, but they still had meat in them. So it's very, very early, it was early September. And we were seeing 20 to 30 percent mortality. I think Tracy and you guys are seeing even higher. In, in East Bay and stuff. So, so this is going to have a, a huge impact. And it's not only going to be an impact on Galveston Bay. We're seeing similar uh, low, low salinities uh, in Matagorda Bay and in San Antonio Bay, certainly in the upper parts to it. And, and to kind of kind of give you a little bit of you know, biology 101 here to kind of show you the significance of all this fresh water, the optimal salinity range for an oyster is, is usually 12 to 30 parts per thousand. You know, open ocean is 35 parts per thousand of salt. And so we're in East Galveston Bay, when we sampled a couple weeks ago, we were seeing salinities that were less than, less than one, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 salinity. So it's basically fresh water all throughout East Galveston Bay. Galveston Bay proper, we were seeing salinity, most of them were less than two. Uh, some of the work that has been done by, uh, I don't know, some of you may remember Dr. Sammy Ray, kind of the world's most renowned oyster biologist probably in the country. Uh, Sammy used to always talk, when we get to chatting about oysters, he'd always talk about, you know, uh, the, 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 the fresh water and, and, and the need for fresh water for oysters. And, and so one of the things that, that, that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to in just a minute, kind of, kind of, I don't want to leave you all doom and gloom here. There is a, maybe a little bit of a silver lining to some of this. 
But one of the things I think we have working in our favor is that oysters are an incredibly resilient animal. You know, they, they don't move. So they're subjected to whatever the environment throws at them. They've adapted to live in these estuarine systems, which are very typically shallow. They, they see wide fluctuations in salinity, as, as we're seeing with, with Hurricane Harvey. They also are exposed to high ranges, uh, uh, ranges in temperature, highs of you know, 80, 90 degrees in some shallow areas, and all the way down to freezing temperatures. But the oysters can't move to get away from it. Fish will leave the system and come back in when it's more favorable. So oysters have developed some very unique strategies, biologically, physiologically, that allow them to survive. So that's one plus, I think, that we have working in our favor, is that these are very resilient animals. Oysters are, are, are what we call protandrous. Uh, they're born as a male, uh, and then as they get older, they change to a female. Um, they, uh, but they also have the unique capability, which in events like this can be very helpful, is that they can change back from a female back to a male. So they're very, they jump back and forth, and that can be very valuable from the standpoint of getting more gametes into the water, getting more spawning, getting more spat settling on, on this culch that uh, hopefully would be going into the water. Um, the other thing that, that, it, that I think is, is in our favor is oysters grow relatively very fast. Uh, they, they do most of their growth in the first year. They're sexually mature four weeks after setting. They, they swim in the water as a larvae. They spawn. The larvae's in the water for about two weeks swimming around. Uh, it's looking for habitat, some hard substrate to settle on. It, it uses some chemical cues uh, based on the, the fouling organisms that occur on hard substrate, whether it's oysters or a tin can or whatever. And they'll settle on that and they change their shape, cement themselves down, and they become the, start growing as what we all think of as an oyster. Once that settles in cement, within four weeks, that oyster is sexually mature and starts spawning. Now granted, it's a small, it's the size of your thumbnail or less, uh, and so it's not going to be able to produce as many eggs as, say, an adult would. But, but the fact that it's spawning every year and, and, and throughout the summer certainly bodes in a survival strategy that, that, is, that is helpful. Um, so assessing the habitat, some of the things that we're starting to work on now, I'm just going to run through these real quick and kind of wrap up some of the other speakers. We're using a number of gears, certainly our, our routine dredge gears. Uh, we utilize uh, various um, remote sensing technology, this is side scan sonar uh, that we use in the base to kind of map uh, that hard substrate, kind of see what, where, where the habitat is, what the oysters are looking like. We use divers, put divers in the water and, and actually quadrat sampling, collect the oysters and, and, and quantify what's there. Um, use, we're starting using a new gear, it's called a patent tong, it's a hydraulic type of dredge uh, that lowers over the side. It gets a uniform sample, much, very similar to a, a quadrat, so we can know, if we know what's in a known area, <coughs> then we can extrapolate that out to, uh, to what the whole reef complex looks like, or and then ultimately what the whole system looks like. So patent tongs. Side scan sonar gives us some images that look something like this. This is from Hurricane Ike. This is in East Galveston Bay. Uh, you can see pre-Ike was over 300 acres after Ike. That same reef is, is pretty well silted over. And then lastly, I wanted to point to, uh, this is a uh, some new technology that we're, we've started using now. This is a, um, it's called an adaptive resolution imaging sonar. This, think, think uh, ultrasound. It's the same technology they use in, in looking at the fetal uh, movement in, in, in a womb. Uh, this is using, taken solely with sound waves. And so it gives us a, an image that has high resolution. We can get down to centimeter accuracy uh, using this, this technology. So we're able to get in, and, and it, it doesn't matter that the water is milk, you know, muddy brown. This doesn't need visible light. It's using all sound to, 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 to in order to get these images. So we use this. We can actually identify the length of oysters and, and the abundance of oysters in the area. So we're going to be using this as well in, in, our, in our assessment as we go forward. So to kind of wrap up my last slide, I, I wanted to, to kind of bring us back around that, that you know, even though we've had this huge, major impact on, our, on these resources in, in, the, in coastwide, um, there is, there is a glimmer of, of hope. And I think, you know, I personally am going to hang on that, that glimmer. And uh, um, with all the physiology of the animal, one of the things that, you know, as I said, this 50 plus inches of rain is not something that's been seen anywhere in the country uh, or in the world that I'm aware of. But certainly in the U.S., we don't haven't seen this kind of impact that, that, that can be looked at. But we do have the opportunity to kind of go back in time maybe and look at other events that may not have been as significant 
but, but certainly are similar, very similar. And I mentioned Dr. Sammy Ray, uh, one of the things he used to always talk to, and we used to talk about it, he always referred back to Hurricane Claudette, for those of you who may remember. Claudette was a storm that came through, uh, dumped 42 inches of rain in 1979 in Alvin. Uh, at the time when that storm came through, West Galveston Bay really didn't produce anything relative to oysters. There were oysters there, uh, but the salinities were high, temperatures were high. They had a lot of mortality from uh, uh, dermo, the disease, uh, and drills, a lot of predation on oysters in, in West Galveston Bay. Hurricane Claudette came through, dumped 42 inches in that watershed it came in. And this is the landings, commercial landings, uh, starting in 1977. Uh, by quarter, basically, or it's by monthly landings, uh, commercial landings. And if you look about three years post Claudette, we saw some tremendous, and the industry, I think, realized a huge benefit of, of production of oysters that took place in West Galveston Bay. So, so I'm, I'm gonna hang my hat on this, and, and I think hopefully in, in, in three years or so, we'll be looking at high numbers like this for Galveston as well. So with that, I'm gonna hang up and uh, the three of you, if you don't mind, will speak from uh, your seats. I think those mics are live. Uh, so Tom, do you, uh, I want to introduce Tom Delay. Tom's a board member of the Galveston Bay Foundation. And uh, you know, I think most of you or many of you have been to his restaurant. And it's a wonderful place. And uh, you know, for folks who love oysters, love eating oysters, it's, it's, there's no better place. So uh, Tom has connections and he, and he believes very much in sustainability. And he, you know, he's a great, uh, believer in Galveston Bay, so I thought just having a little bit of perspective here, Tom, from you would be helpful for the audience. Well, it's certainly a, a pretty dismal uh, report, unfortunate from the orchards that we're getting in samplings. You know, we serve about 10,000 orchards on the half shell a week. So if you start to put that in perspective, it's a huge piece of my business. And we have been doing this for, for many years. And now we have this particular event after going through Ike, so we're going to have to really make some good decisions about what we do going forward. But I think this is a great opportunity for us to get to a sustainable uh, practices in our bay, to for everyone to be involved, and to understand what orchards have really done for us in our bay. I mean, we've got uh, great projects that GBF has done in, in West Bay and other bays. And so this is a great opportunity to, uh, to pursue those, uh, and, and possibly even uh, that we need to work some kind of uh, workers commission of some sort that we can represent not only from uh, uh, oystermen uh, but also from restaurants and others who make money or sell or buy or dredge oysters. Uh, so that's something we ought to consider because we really do need a voice and we need uh, collaboration from uh, the community and from the legislature to, uh, to, to move forward. Uh, I, I, we're, we're thankful of, of HB 51. Uh, I particularly am, am interested in the vessel, vessel monitoring system. I think it's one of those kinds of tools that the, that the Texas Parks and Wildlife will be able to use in the future to help uh, control and, and uh, monitor the bay so that we can have some, some more adequate uh, uh, monitoring. So uh, I hope that we'll continue that. Um, that collaboration and, and uh, we'll hopefully we can get some horses out of Louisiana for a little while until our bay recuperates. Great, thanks Tom. Okay, so, thank uh, you Roz, you know, again, just uh, today you're here, can you give us your perspective, you know, I, I, I hope I did a, a service to y'all. I, I know how hard your business is, and I know how hard you work, I know the pressures, uh, but, but where do you see us moving forward here? I mean. Obviously, you know, when they cut down your sack limits and they cut down your days and it makes it a little harder to make a living, but, you know, in terms of uh, hoping that we can really turn this thing around for Galveston Bay, obviously we need some cooperation from Mother Nature. It's, it's beyond just management of the fishery. You know, fishery is sort of adaptive uh, when we need to get there. Uh, but Tracy, just give us your perspective and Roz, and could you help mine as well? Sure. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, House Bill 51 was great, there's, there's lots of good in it, but with, as with any legislation, there's always a little tweaking that needs to be done. It, it has some issues. Uh, so does the Parks and Wildlife uh, uh, proclamations that were passed here in August. Uh, you know, Texas needs to be promoting oyster cultivation, it needs to be promoting oyster farming. 
just to be doing like my company does. This year, our company has harvested 100% of our oysters from our private leases. Last year was 92%. The year before that was 90%. These are, this is during the time that we're having all these issues in the public reefs. There's no problem with my, well, up until Harvey, there was no problem with my private leases. As you can see from the, the box of shell outside, we're gonna have issues for the next couple of years. But as he said, after that, hopefully we get a good spat set and we have a bumper crop. You know, there's always a plus. I shouldn't have to put any substrate out this year. I would rather make money catching oysters than put substrate, but that being said. Um, to, to really promote oyster farming, we have to have favorable regulations. We can't just keep piling burdens upon the person that is investing a tremendous amount of money. It's a tremendous risk, as you can see by what just happened. I mean, we planted shell this year and last year that we haven't even that had orchard on that we never even got a chance to recoup the benefits of. So now it's going to be hard for me in the future to keep investing until I can get a return on my investment. Uh, House Bill 51, one of the issues is with that 30% of the shell that goes back over the public reefs, well, I have to give up 30% of my shell that I grow on my private lease too. The guy that's harvesting from the public reef, he's, he's, he's selling it and the dealer has to forfeit 30%. I grow mine and I have to forfeit 30%. I'm already investing a bunch of money. And so it, 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 it's really a, a, a double taxation or, or it's, a, it's a penalty. It's hard. It's, it's hard to compete in the marketplace. It's hard to compete against Louisiana already and it, it's gonna be very difficult. So there's a few things that need to be changed. The SAC limit, it should apply to the public lease. They're, in, they're the ones in bad shape. My private leases were not in bad shape, but I have to adhere to a 25 SAC limit. I can't harvest on Saturday and Sunday for my private lease. These are oysters I grew myself. We need to fix those kind of problems and it, it's gonna take a voice and it's gonna take more than just the industry or the leaseholders, it's going to take folks like you that, that really are interested in sustainable cultivation of oysters. And, and uh, we need to get the Parks and Wildlife to really aggressively push for more private leases up and down the whole coast. That is the way to solve the problem. House Bill 51 and the Parks and Wildlife rules will help but it also is gonna take the fishermen and the buyers to treat the public reef just as if it was their own. They cannot keep treating those bays like it's a free-for-all. You have to respect them, just like you were gonna go back year after year and you want to make a living at it. And you wanted your grandchildren to do the same. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Chris, thank you. So there's, there's, there's a lot of background we haven't even gotten to. Maybe Lance, you can help me out with this because I, I don't think everybody understands this. But so our Texas Bay or our Galveston Bay has about 12,000 acres of reef that's harvestable, give or take. Um, 10,000 of that is public reef. So the oyster season starts on November 1st and ends April 30th, and any oysterman can get out there and harvest from that public reef. Uh, but 2,000 of it, and it's only in Galveston, until, is on top of okay, so the numbers are, are uh, roughly the same, but about 2,000 on top of the 12, I guess, is uh, private leases. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen in any other base system in Texas. It's a historical remnant of something that happened a long, long time ago, but it sort of works well, right? So Tracy's talking about his lease, so they do, it's, it's kind of like a farming operation, right? He, uh, and, and Rob, you have leases too. Right, so they, they seed those those areas and they harvest them themselves and, and it is way more sustainable than this first come first serve of public reefs. But with that said, you've got a, a public resource, right? So our reefs are, you know, in the state of Texas historically are owned by all of us. So it's hard in one level to privatize that, but from a sustainability standpoint, maybe we should be doing more of it because those guys then take care of it and don't compete and go first come first serve. The other thing, uh, Lance, I hope I got that right. Uh, you know, I talked to Lance about this a little bit earlier, and Ross, I promise I will speak. I want you to speak too. Um, but we don't uh, we don't allow any uh, you know, 
oyster mayor culture in Texas. So you go to uh, North Carolina and Virginia and Massachusetts and people are growing oysters in cages. You know, it's like a real farming operation. Uh, very manual, lots of manual labor, uh, but lots of oysters that they grow. Uh, and, and we don't, we're not set up. And Lance was saying that it would probably take legislative uh, changes to allow that to happen in Texas. So, and so, you know, it's not all wonderful if you have a bunch of mariculture around uh, oyster mariculture that it presents some problems as well. But it's a solution that we could theoretically look at. We sort of have to look outside the box, in my mind, you know. Um, and I know, um, you know, there was an effort by the commission to create restoration leases, right? So right now we do this restoration, and after a couple of years, it could be subject to, to oyster harvesting. So, you know, you spend a lot of money on oyster restoration. You saw the one that TPW did, you did, and you know, then all of a sudden the oysters are gone. So there's a lot of different pieces that are still out there in play. And you know, my thought on the oyster restoration lease is that that benefits the oysterman because we we're not going to take existing oyster, you know, reefs and call that restoration. We're going to create a new reef out there that could serve as a seed source for the all year harvest. So in that sense, it'd be a win-win. So again, uh, there's a lot of intricacies here. We can't cover it all in two hours, one and a half hours, and one night. Um, but Ross, why don't you give us your perspective, and uh, Tom, uh, Tom, Scott, are there some slides we need to show? Would you, you like, you would like to? <laughs> Yeah, you can play the video uh, for everyone. Um, he's going to play a video of a restoration effort uh, that we did just in July. Uh, and it's basically going to show culture material that we went out and planted right here in Galveston Bay. And afterwards, then I'll go on <coughs> and continue to speak. Or I can actually speak during the... Uh, the video. Do you want to turn the volume down? Uh, yeah, you can just mute the volume. There's okay. nothing to be heard for background music. So, again, with, with you know, with with Harvey and the devastation that it brought, uh, I I think it's a prime example to show uh, that shows everyone that we could set out all these rules and we could put out all this effort, we could put out all this money into the bay, and Mother Nature can come take it away in a matter of days, and it's going to take an effort not just by uh, you know, the state, but also oystermen in general to, to bring the bay back. And uh, House Bill 51, I, I see a lot of good in it. Personally, as a, as a buyer, it, it makes my job easy. Uh, if, if the oystermen have to go out and catch a 100% you know, perfect oyster and the rules are so strict on them, it makes it very easy on me. But if I'm going out as a fisherman, um, some of the rules are very challenging. Uh, the 5% is, is very difficult because typically when you pull when you pull up a, a dredge of oysters, they're very muddy and they're not clean. They're not pretty like you see in the restaurants when you go to eat them. And you could have uh, a couple dead oysters in there. And by the time you throw that in a basket, which it looks like a perfect oyster, if you get boarded and checked, that oyster could split up and there's two shells there and you, you get another one, two to three, and all of a sudden, wow, you're over 5%. So it's very strict. But again, um, I do believe that there were definitely changes that needed to be made to keep fishermen more accountable. Um, the vessel monitoring system, absolutely, I think it's great. I, I hope the, the funding comes through and the grants come through because it will help to keep fishermen honest, help to keep, you know, we put out these investments and uh, it's going to help to, you know, to track, mo uh, to track boats to make sure there's less poaching and less boats working in these closed bays such as Powder Horn and St. Charles Bay. So that's definitely a, a positive, in my opinion. Um, the the limiting of the day, um, you know, you're, you, typically we're never working six, seven days a week because of Mother Nature in general. You get northerns and fronts that come through, and they stop us uh, from. So we're going to lose more days now. But it, it's a challenge. We're going to have to bite the bullet and hunker down and fight. Um, as you saw in that video, that was uh, a drone shot of us planting culture material that we, we set up back in the bay. Uh, my company alone, we set out over 100,000 tons of rock and culture material into the Gulf of Mexico. We wish more of, the, more of that could have gone into Galveston Bay, but there were some issues in the past few years, so um, thankfully this summer we were able to continue and uh, add out more culture. And we plan to continue doing that. Um, there's been some talk of well, let's, let's just create new leases, new reefs. I think that's a great idea. I think some restoration reefs would be great. I think GB, GBF would love a restoration reef to have some on Galveston Bay. I know there's um, some, some quite wealthy individuals who would love to go out and 
uh, make, their, make their own oyster reef. But we can't just start chopping up existing oyster reefs all along the, the Gulf Coast and hand them out. I, I believe these, these, belong, these, are, these oyster reefs that are existing are belong to the state of Texas and individuals who, who want to work in, in this industry. Uh, I believe there should be some new leases, but they should be carved out and built from nothing, built from scratch. There's plenty of areas, I think Lance would agree with me, along the Gulf Coast that, that doesn't have hard bottom. Yeah, it's true. So, um, I, I think that's a, you know, there's, there's lots of options, but it's going to take some, some work on both efforts from oystermen, um, with the state, and also organizations and individuals like yourself. So I, I look forward to, to working with you, and I, I hope I can answer any questions anyone has. Yeah, so thank you guys for being here. Um, yeah, we are running, running a little bit late, uh, but I hope you guys want to stay around for time to come some questions. So I'd be glad to, uh, if anybody in the audience has any questions. Uh, again, you know, there's so, only so much we can cover in a, in a bit of time. Uh, I, I love the spirit here tonight. Uh, I think that's what we need going forward. Uh, like I said, I know it's not easy, uh, but you know, ideally uh, we're all in this thing together and we can work together on hopefully uh, joint interests and, and really look forward to kind of Lance's trend lines. Those, those red lines didn't look very good for Galveston Bay on some of those slides. So uh, we'd love to see those go uh, back the other direction. And, and Lance talked about it, just all the ecosystem service benefits of oysters. It's not just about the commercial harvest, it's about oysters filtering 50 gallons of water a day. It's about um, you know, the little fish that love to come hang out in an oyster reef because they can hide from the big fish, but then the big fish come, and then the fishermen come. And so, you know, reefs are so important for so many reasons, um, uh, but certainly the oyster uh, harvest is, is, is a main one. So, uh, anybody in the audience have any questions that we want to address? If indeed we get 12 to 240,000 dollars per acre off of Jerry's oyster reef that he builds, it seems to me that if he's truly building it where there were no oysters before, and not building on top of some former oyster uh, reef, it seems to me that he's giving us something and he should at least get some benefit of a break from the 30 pounds uh, compared to the, the open water. Thank you for the question, Dick. I think that's really a Lance response in terms of what the state might say to that. Yeah, I, I think the I think the way that that as this was looked at that closer to you. Sorry, I think the way that this was looked at with the with the uh, uh, the thirty percent is that even though they're putting culch down, the the oysters that settle on that culch are wild spawn. I mean, it's and and it, under Parks and Wildlife statute, the, the, it's a, it's part of that natural resource. It's a it's a, we, the, 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 it belongs to the citizens of the state. Even that larval oyster that's swimming in the water column that, that is spawned out, it's part of that natural resource. And, and yes, you're right, they, they're putting culch down and that's helping to collect spat and oysters will grow and, and, they, and the base system benefits from that. But ultimately, that's still a state natural resource even though it's settled onto their bed because the, the larvae is coming from public waters of the state of Texas. And so that's where some of that, that rationale is coming from, is that that's still a natural resource belonging to the citizens of the state of Texas. They have some exclusive rights granted to them because of the certificate of location. Uh, and that certainly is, is giving them opportunities that other fishermen don't have. And so there are some, certainly some benefits uh, that they, they recognize and they realize through that, that, those operations. Tracy? I'd like to respond to that. <laughs> You know, we take real good care of our oyster reefs. We usually have a pretty good abundance. We don't scratch it down to nothing. We have uh, oysters that are growing on there that are four, five, and six years old. That's the large females that spawn hundreds of millions of larvae a year. Uh, those oysters on our reefs also produce spat and spawn that go out and attach to the public reef. And so we're providing <coughs> larva for them. I'd like to use a little analogy here. The state has a, a forest here full of loblolly pine. I have a fallow field next to it. The wind blows and here's that little loblolly pine seed sits over on my property. Whose tree is it when it grows up? Is it the state's or is it mine? I mean, it, the, the seed floating around is state resource. There's, we, we are substrate, we lack substrate. There's an abundance of larvae. 
We need more substrate. Our reefs provide larva for the rest of the bays. And yes, sometimes I'm sure some of that state larva lands on our reef. It's a give and take. It's not, it's not all one way. I don't believe it's all the state's uh, larva. Yeah. Uh, so uh, without taking a position, um, I think there's room potentially for compromise at some point. Um, you know, I'm not saying yes or no on this in particular, but again, uh, if we could all do a better job of working together on this thing, uh, you know, maybe make some reasonable changes. So, any other questions? Straight back. The, the question for those that didn't hear, the question was lifting the moratorium on private leases. Yes, sir. The, there, there is no moratorium on leases at this point. There was a moratorium that was issued by the General Land Office. Parks and Wildlife has never issued a moratorium on leases. Um, we, in fact, as, as Bob alluded to, you know, we have had a conversation with our commission about um, looking at aquaculture, uh, off-bottom aquaculture, more intensive aquaculture. Uh, the practice I think that Tracy and Roz participate in, from my perspective, I call it really more passive aquaculture uh, operations. Um, and, uh, and so we have had some conversations with our commission about that. I've, I've looked at aquaculture op operations in other, every state in the, in the U.S. that has an oyster aquaculture program. And in, in, in many, many cases uh, in talking with these other states, uh, some of the information that they have shared with us uh, based on the how they have to operate or how they operate their programs that there are some ch checks and balances that have to be implemented in order to have a in their mind a, a productive off-bottom culture program and currently there are some some of those checks and balance for example uh, one of the several of the states have a policy or requirement that if you're going to participate in an off-bottom culture uh, operation in, in these designated areas that they have defined. Uh, there has to be a performance bond put up in case that individual chooses to abandon that infrastructure and leave it in the water, in the bay. So I mean, you're talking metal cages, uh, other types of infrastructure, floating barges, um, cage, floating cages. Uh, so there's a lot of infrastructure there. So, so the performance bond then provides a, an avenue where if somebody abandons that, uh, some can be cleaned up and, and returned back. Um, currently, Parks and Wildlife Commission doesn't have the authority to require any kind of bonds for those kind of activities. Uh, there's also, and, I, and I've had talks and conversation with other state agencies that, that have a finger. It, it's really a, it's a very convoluted, here in Texas, a very convoluted process right now when you look at aquaculture, uh, whether it's freshwater or especially saltwater, uh, because there's multiple agencies that have a, a finger kind of in the pot. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a, a with a, all aquaculture falls under authority of the of the uh, Texas Department of Agriculture, but but Department of Ag also has concerns over the fact that trying to do something in public waters of the state because aquaculture is typically on private property and they get permitted through the Department of Agriculture, and so now we're talking about an activity that's taking place in public waters of the state of Texas and it's going to take up areas that you know that that we have a lot of multiple and competing users of that resource whether it's whether it's recreational fishing whether it's sailing whether it's oil and gas uh, so there's a lot of competing interests and so you have to strategically cite where these places go uh, and so so I think to your, to your back to your question I apologize for kind of getting off track here we have, we have at least discussed the concept of off-bottom, more intensive aquaculture with our commission. We've also explored, as Bob alluded to, the idea of expanding the lease program into other base systems. The concept, and, and we can do that, our commission could do that now. Uh, one of the avenues that, that we're exploring with, with that practice would be, we have a lot of reefs out here. We're looking at really a, more of a, a three-legged stool, if you will. We, we have a lot of reefs out here that are depleted, that need substrate on them. As, as Tracy alluded to, they're fished down, they're, they're hard, it's like a parking lot, there's just nothing on it. And so one of the ideas here is that it's kind of this, you know, public-private partnership with, with industry that we identify some of these areas on existing oyster reef, public reef, uh, that, are, um, uh, that are degraded and have no oysters on it. 
but you allow a, a, the industry to utilize a, a certain amount of acreage on that existing public reef uh, for the period of time. And currently in statute, that's set at 15 years. Uh, there probably is a need to kind of go back and revisit some of the, the terms on this, but right now you can set it for 15 years with the idea being that in 15 years, that tract, that lease reverts back to public resource. So the industry has, the fisherman has had the opportunity to utilize that tract. They, they, their return on investment should be a little faster because they're not having to put a lot of culch down to build up the, out of the mud so that they actually have a substrate that larvae would sit on. They put culch down and a thin veneer, they're gonna get spat set on it and get oysters growing on it. So that kind of helps accelerate you know, that, that time of planting to production. Uh, with that idea as well, we were looking at some other options of kind of helping restore some of the other public reefs, but that 15 year term revert back to a public reef after 15 years, but creating an, a, an opportunity for that fisherman maybe to transition to another area without any rent fees and stuff that, so that when that 15 years is up, they just move right over to another track that's already producing so there, there's no lost production per se. And so that's one that we've been talking about, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, sanctuary reefs, if you will, or restoration reefs is one that's also been uh, discussed in, in conjunction where groups that wanted to create oyster reefs for uh, wave attenuation or for just the, the habitat value they provide, they would also be afforded protection for at least a term that currently under statute 15 years. Uh, and certainly the, the legislature could decide if they wanted to make that longer or shorter. That, that certainly is their prerogative. So, so there's some things that are being looked at and discussed about, about that. I think this whole idea, that the, this whole Hurricane Harvey issue is probably going to ele elevate this to a higher level, get it kind of accelerated a little more because clearly there's a need you know, to get culch and get that, that resource back producing again. All right, thank you. So maybe I saw a couple of hands up over here. Uh, Sharon, do you want to ask the last question? Because we probably do need to wrap. Okay. This may seem dumb, but I'm very concerned about all the effort and money that went into recreating Dollar Reach and then having it gone in less than four and a half days. Is there some way that there could be a vertical height established beyond which they cannot dredge so that there's something left to rebuild? Is it gone? Uh, you know, it's still there. I mean, dollar is still there. I, and uh, you know, one of the things I think that we are trying to do with that, I have to, I have to also make you make make the point known is that the funding that we received to put culch back out on dollar was a direct uh, grant. Was a grant from the National Marine Fisheries Service based on a declaration of a fishery disaster as it resulted from Hurricane Ike. So those funds were were directed had to go back to restoring a fishable oyster reef uh, and trying to get that fishery back up. And so the purpose for putting that culture there was served in providing substrate and providing an oyster resource for the industry to utilize. Now, what we are looking at doing as we do this going forward is that we will you know, be looking at those areas very closely and using our, this, the, this threshold that we utilize now, when it looks like it's getting below that threshold, we will step in and close those areas down very quickly. And so uh, that will, should afford some protection of at least getting down to the smaller oysters. But, but, but again, that reef was built for the sole purpose of providing and building that reef back up because it was fishable prior to Hurricane Ike. It was a fishable reef prior to Hurricane Ike. It was silted over. We put the colch down to get it back in production uh, to, 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 for its original use that was there. And, uh, and, it, and it accomplished that. It's just that with, with the you know, shortage of other acreage around, it just concentrated the boats there. Uh, but the culture is still there. It's still you know, spatting up. It's still producing oysters um, to this day. And, and I'd like to, to add to that. Uh, I fished Dollar Reef when I was 16 years old. Uh, it was a great reef, unfortunately. Uh, you know, Mother Nature uh, did what she does sometimes. But uh, the state did a great job bringing the, uh, with the restoration product and brought the efforts back. Uh, but I do think oystermen do sometimes get a bad rep, a bad rap sometimes. Um, you hear the word dredging, you assume that we're, you know, we're throwing this dredge on and we're digging the entire bay up. Um, that, that's, that's not the case. Uh, when, you, when you work an oyster reef, a, a really good fisherman, 
um, they cultivate that ground, and it's, it's almost like a rake, and it's spreading the reef softly, and it's growing the reef. Oysters, they typically build up, they don't really build wide. And when you have fishermen working a reef and spreading it out and working and cultivating it with proper management, uh, you can really grow a healthy, thriving oyster ecosystem. And I think that's something uh, that we're doing, and I, I believe uh, it's a testament that shows that the, the Parks and Wildlife went out, did a great job with the restoration. There were healthy oysters, fishermen went out and fished them. Parks and Wildlife came in, shut it down when they felt like it needed to be shut down. And that's, and I believe that's how uh, we should coincide with one another. Yeah, so just to wrap up, I mean, I think, I think it's fair to say that um, pretty much in all the things we deal with at the Galveston Bay Foundation, there's, there's a lot of gray area. It's not necessarily black and white. Uh, there's often two sides to the story. And again, um, you know, our, our history is, is really trying to bring users together to, to find solutions. And, and we, you know, you all know the business better than we do, but if we can help, we want to be part of it. Uh, certainly from a TBWD standpoint, uh, from a private oysterman standpoint, uh, you know, uh, let us know how we can help and, and maybe we can, you know, do a better job. So Tom, I know, I know you're committed and Tracy and, and Roz, you guys are committed as well. So uh, thank you very much for being here. How about a round of applause for our